I wanted to talk today about freedom and intentionality. Like I need us to be intentional about the things. Things don't just happen. I know the lottery right now, the Powerball is up to something ridiculous. Let me see. I don't even look at it because I'm, I'm never playing it. $522 million. I know people go get the ticket. You know, they're going to stand in line with no mask and catch COVID. Y'all go ahead and do that. I will not. Uh, $522 million. There's no winner. There was no winner. Uh, I guess the drawing was whatever yesterday. Today's tonight, I think there's another drawing. And I know every season we go through this, the, the, you know, these, these, what I would do if I got half of this, you know, because you're going to get half, right? So if I had $275 million, I would, you know, and then people start rattling off all the things they would do. But the reality is, Angela E. Matthews, most people hit the lotto several years after they are right back to where they were before the lotto broke. So there's clearly, it's not about the money. Nope, it is not about the money. It's not about the money. Even though we all think it is, and we all say every year, I wanna make this much more money. And I'm gonna, no one says I'm gonna spend this much more money, which is really interesting. Everyone says, I'm gonna make this much more money. People don't say I'm gonna invest this much more money. They we're always out for more and more and more. And I guess our question today is, if you did have that much more, what would your life actually look like and how would it be different than today? And I want to freak it even more. Like when, when somebody asked me this last night, actually, I was having a conversation, a business conversation, and they said, what's your number? And I knew what it was. I said it because I, I actually, I did the math. There's like a number for me personally, and then there's a number for me in business, right? So they're, they're two different numbers. And my personal number is not that much. Why? Because I don't live extravagantly. I don't have a closet full of Birkin bags and red bottom shoes. I don't aspire to have, I got nice things. Let me just be clear. I like nice things, but you know, I'm not someone that's going to spend $10,000, $20,000 on a watch. Not me. I can't make that make sense. Um, I like nice cars, but my car is paid for. I, actually, yeah, I, I love to live well, but right now, my home is paid for like, and that was an accomplishment. I mean, a big accomplishment. And I feel like, you know, the freedom that that has brought me allows me to, to sit in some things, do some things, say no to some things. And I, that freedom means more to me than more money or, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So what's your number? Do you know your number? When did you find out what your number was? Um, I think I've always had a number since I thought about money in regards to numbers and money, you know, because I'm always thinking, how much further do I have to run before I could just sit down? And then when I realized like, OK, well, I'm sitting down, but is this the world I wanted to be in when I sat down? So it's like, OK, let's adjust the number a little bit. And so my number is not really that crazy. Right. I think as long as I have at least three million sitting off in the distance, I'm good. Like and my kids are good. And my husband's good. Before, it was a lot less when it was just me. Because again, I don't need as much similar to you. But now we got a rope in other people's destinies with mine too. So now I got to accommodate for them. And as long as I have that much sitting there, cash invested, that's the key word. Right, I was going to say, not cash. Not cash. Well, access. I want to say I have to have access to it. But not cash, right? It has to be working for me. So as long as that number is always working and potentially easy to access. I don't got to work. I don't have to think about it. I don't have to do anything. And it has to be a net number. That's not like expenses and all that. It's not like fluff, fluff worth. It's net. So talk about how you arrived at the number. And I want everyone listening, you know, to be gut level honest about this number. You ask somebody, what's your number? Oh, I need $50 million. For what? Like, do you need $50 million? Well, I need to build a legacy. Da, 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 da. You know, it's like, does it happen like that? And I'm, I'm watching so many people get wealthy in the last five years who literally got wealthy within like a calendar year mm -hmm. investing in different things. And the market has been, it's up 23%. It's up 23%. Some of you have money in a bank account earning 0.1%, 23% if you were invested in the market. And I think about when we first met and how I was, I've always been dabbling, but I've like been full in with the whole vision, with the, with the dividends and all of that. And it has changed the trajectory of the way I think about money. What goes into that number that you arrived at, that $3 million? 
So for me, one is if I'm getting an interest rate return of about 10% a year, even though investing in the stock market just overall has much more than that, as Karen said, 23%, um, that's kind of what I need to live off of and to fund all the other accounts, right? And so that's what I'm thinking. It's how much do I need if I don't own a home or own where I live? How much do I need to pay a mortgage? How much do I need to retire my mother and other people that are invested wow. in my life, right? How much do I need to have, I don't know, five vacations a year, right? Because that's my happy number. I need a vacation in the winter. I need a vacation every season, let's just be honest. And, and one for good measure, apparently. And just one, one for just measure. for, you know, randomness, right? And then what am I going to do in terms of giving, right? Giving is a really big thing for me, philanthropy, giving forward, all those things. And then what's my just feel good number? Like how much money do I just need on hand in case the world, I don't know, like goes crazy, right? How much money can I just grab in a bag and be out? (laughs) And so that's kind of how my my thinking goes. And when I say that number 3 million, it doesn't have to be a now number. It's just the number that I'm consciously working towards. Like we just invested in hotels. Right. Um, and that's amazing. I love it. I never thought that would be the wait, case. Ha, wait. Ha, so I was, I was talking to you earlier and I said, the, the, you know, you came on as a tech person and each time you came on, you were doing something else. And I was thinking about how you know, you pivot, your pivot game, your ability to be able to look around. And some of us don't, don't pivot, don't shift no matter what's happening. You know, I remember having this argument with my father. He was like, well, I remember when bread was 23 cents. I was like, the bread is never going to be 23 cents again, man. Stop telling me about, I bought this house for $24,000. I'm like, you will never buy a house in this neighborhood for $24,000 again. The world has changed. Like, stop being stuck in the past about, well, I'm not spending more than this. And I'm like, but have you checked the market lately? You know, it's it's weird how people won't shift with the way the world is going. What, what has uh, propelled you to pivot? I think for me, it's you know when you have to pivot internally. I think a lot of us have that internal nudge where you just feel as if you're a little bit stale, where you feel not stale compared to what's around you, but stale compared to what you've been saying all the time, stale compared to what's um, being put into your spirit. You just feel a little like, this is cool, but I just don't feel as if this is what I'm meant to be doing right now, or at least this isn't my only purpose. And so a lot of people think that they have this one thing, this one career that they worked really, really hard in and they sacrifice so much in it. And that's why they have to stay in it or they can't venture out and do anything or learn a language, do something else to to stretch their brain. And we get comfortable and complacent. And that's something that I realize that, you know, once you're comfortable for too long, there's a bit of complacency in there. There's a bit of it's just, you're not evolving. And so for me, I think about consciously, what am I evolving? When I came on the show that many years ago, which is crazy, I can't believe, that's a long time. <laughs> like seven years is, is a lifetime for some kids out there. And I was really passionate about tech and tech being in the hands of our people because tech was blowing up in New York City, right? And we were getting left out of it. And people were getting equity deals and all this stuff, right? But then after a while, people got so consumed with being consumers of tech. And I remember this so clearly, and I point to it a lot because it's almost like my coming of age story on your show. And people are like, tech this, tech that. And they're on Instagram, they're they're on Snapchat. And I'm just like, ain't nobody paying you for this. You're on these platforms like it's your job and no one is paying you for it. And then I remember thinking, wait a second, actually I'm getting paid for it because I own Facebook. So go on people. Go be free and use your up your life. Go look at other people's lives. Do what you want. Yes, I feel bad about it, but you have a decision to make and you made that decision and I'm getting paid for it. And that Wait, made you me bought, feel better. You bought Facebook before it hit a price that I can't, I can't afford it right now. What, what was the price when you first bought Facebook? I must have bought Facebook. I mean, I remember when they uh, became public, when they IPO'd. And I didn't do it then because I really wasn't sure what the business model was and all that. But I remember definitely getting Facebook at maybe a hundred. It's now $339 a share. And I definitely bought it at a hundred a share, 150. It was one of those stocks that, especially because I'm an entrepreneur, 
We used to do Facebook ads. And then I heard my friends, my other peers talking about they spend $100,000 a month on Facebook ads. I was like, wait a second. Facebook's making money. And these are groups of thousands of people talking about I'm spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on Facebook ads. And so that was a no brainer. Even when LinkedIn was public, I used to own LinkedIn. Everything that I saw that people purchased that I even felt a little salty about, like say iPhones, it just made me feel better owning it. That's how I bought Apple when everyone was going crazy over like an iPhone four or six. You were like, I'm going to go crazy and buy. And I didn't get into the Apple game because again, I got into the stock market late. Um, Primarily, you know, I remember being one of the people, this is just gambling. You know, I remember that conversation. And there've been several people in my life that have shown me the light and even before I met you. But, you know, once I figured out the dividend that I can get paid for a stock, even if the stock is not performing well, like, and I'm, this is the dis- disclosure. I'm going to tell you some stocks that I own, just like Angela just did. Do not go out and get these stocks because we're telling you about stocks that we own because it's too late now <laughs> when we got the stocks. Like I bought I bought Bank of America when it was like $11, $12. Um, and I remember it like it was yesterday because that is one of my highest performing stocks right now. Um, I bought, um, I got Star- Starbucks when it was in the 50s. When it was in the fifties, you know, it's now trading. I think it's like a hundred and seventy something dollars today, you know. Um, and and I right now I'm holding on to AT and T only because I feel like it's not going anywhere, even though it sucks. It like the price is it sucks and it's cheap, but I feel like it's not going anywhere. But I also I'm like it pays a dividend. Hey, you haven't cut their dividend even though the price. And so I'm still getting paid in more shares of this. So I'm not buying more of it, but it's, it's, you know, I'm getting more every single quarter when they pay a dividend because I own that much of it. And I'm like, and they'll turn it around or they won't. And then if I do sell it, I take the loss, but I've been getting a dividend. So I'm, I'm struggling with that one, you know, but what's been fun, it invests me in what's going on in the world. Now I have a subscription to Financial Times. So I'm seeing what's happening in the world, these lithium batteries and stuff. And I'm like, okay, solar, you know, and what it, it makes you a better global citizen, but also it invests you in the world that we live in, in terms of what's happening, because you now have to do your research about these companies. And it's not just about what I like. It's not like GameStop, which made no sense, but, but that ta- taught me something too. Anyway, we're with Angela E. Matthews, and I want to spend time this year doing something I haven't done, which is to get into the nuts and bolts of how we actually build wealth. It's not just about having a vision for wealth and saving your money, but how do you actually build wealth? You tr- dropped out. We're investing in hotels. What the hell does that mean, Angela E. Matthews? So it's funny because if you've been with Karen for seven years, doing what you're supposed to do, fighting the good fight to, to becoming financially free, things just actually in your world, odds are not for everyone, but they're a lot better than where they were when you started listening. For a lot of people, it's evolved. And for some people, it hasn't. But for a lot of people, it's gotten better. And so then you get this question of now what? Like I said, you always have to evolve. And so I had a goal last year of owning real estate. And the residential market just really wasn't our thing. I mean, people were coming down to Texas from all over, flooding our market. And I was just not about to pay, I don't know, $300,000 more for something because of COVID. I just refused to. But so that's pause for a second. You're, you're in this big state of Texas, which is a very yeah. complicated state right now. Uh, it is very complicated. Shout out to Harrison County and Houston and Dallas and other areas and the rest of y'all. I don't know. But uh, the market became inflated because, you know, the real estate is valuable now, right? Mm-hmm. And so you were like, that is not a good investment if it's inflated. So you mm-hmm. decided I'm not going to invest in regular residential yes so end of the year you got this chunk of money how did the hotel thing come come so i actually i actually so what happens is you start putting it in your spirit that you want something i don't some people operate from a place of i'm gonna put this intention out here and i'm gonna make it happen all the way but sometimes the things that you need to make it happen just are available at the time. Sometimes you ever work for a goal and you work so hard and it just doesn't happen. Like you're doing everything on your side, but I guess the world's not ready for it. God is like, you're not ready for it on some level and it just doesn't happen. There were things I did last year like that where I was saying, yes, I'm gonna do this. 
and then the opposite would be the result. The opposite intention would happen and I would get crushed. And the thing that I wasn't working on would just happen. And I'm like, what is the moral? What is the lesson here? Like be in flow. This isn't even flow. This is just not making sense. Like the thing I'm not working on is working and the thing I'm working on isn't working. And so this hotel deal was kind of one of those things where I had an intention. I'm going to own this real estate. Thought it was done. I was like, you know what? I did my part. I saved the money. It's in the account. Lord, I don't understand. And then I met someone who was actually another instructor, um, another colleague, and she was telling me about her doing hotels. And I was like, you could own a hotel? Like, how does that work? And she sat me down and explained it. And then before you know, I actually met the person who owned, who created the deals. And then she just asked me a question, like, would you like to be a hotel owner? And I said, yes, yes, I would. <laughs> and it was the quickest investment that I've done to that scale before, because I knew I was ready. All the dots are ready. There were so many conversations that I had prior to this hotel deal in terms of understanding real estate, in terms of understanding how does it work when I'm a limited partner, instead of understanding what's the payment schedule, what's the return, what's the multiplier, all of these things came to this conversation and I literally got the text in November. Like you're a hotel owner. Wow. Okay. So I could come to Dallas, um, 2024. <laughs> That's when I, feel I love, okay. Not Travel. 2022, not 2023, no, uh, 2024. No. 2024. When I feel like I can get on a plane, uh, cause people be acting out and not trying to breathe and stuff. Um, and wear masks. All right. And I could stay at a hotel that is owned by Angela E. Matthews. No, my hotel is in Indianapolis what okay <laughs> all right all right all right well that's not happening I'm probably not going to Indianapolis but all right so why Indianapolis you don't have to invest where you want to live one <laughs> and you just have to invest where the numbers make sense so that's a really big part about real estate that a lot of folks kind of uh, go wrong on if you're an investor I mean am I living in Indianapolis no I have no desire to live there at all or Indiana which we were thinking of moving to Chicago this year too but we didn't and I thought Indiana would be great. It's not for me personally to live there. If you live there, I'm happy not you found a place to live that's making you happy. And so all this to say, it doesn't matter where my money is working. Go work. I don't have to be there. My money does. Okay. I'm not cleaning. So, I am not going to clean hotel rooms. There are so, so let me doing that. <laughs> 866-801-8255. If you are thinking about starting a business, and I, I wanted to do this day one on the on the radio, um, because a lot of us, for a lot of us, business is emotional. And what you're saying right now, Angela E. Matthews, is that it's not emotional. It's practical. It's bottom line business. And there may be a spiritual component. Maybe we could talk about that as well. But it's really, is the money working for me? Is the money working? Is my money being put to work? And is it returning an investment? And I used to make a joke, like, I'm going to pimp my money. Bitch better come back with, you know, like, you know, making making fun, like what you're saying right now. Um, but that's really the, the reason why we have money is for it to make more money. And so they can free us, right? So they can put us in a situation to be able to make other choices or make choices, period. Some of us are in high net worth um, jobs, making a lot of money, but we're not free because our money's not actually we're, we're making we're earning but we're not investing so we're, we're constantly playing catch up and then we might be over leveraged with real estate that is not bringing back anything so so talk a little bit about that so indiana of all places the numbers made sense the numbers made a lot of sense and it was a deal that came with two hotels so average deal comes with one this one came with two and i thought that was amazing because it's just again, leverage, you know, I get to own two for one. So if one thing happens wrong with one, the other one can bounce back. And so I love that. And the person that is my partner, which is to tell you that you don't have to do everything yourself. If I had to say, Hey, Angela, go figure out how to invest in a hotel, go speak with, you know, um, Staybridge and all these people. And I'm not doing that. I'm just not right now in this point in my life. However, I found a person that does it and she does it really well. And so we're partners and it's awesome. <laughs> and she gets more money. I'm, I'm cool with that because she's doing more work, but yet my money's making way more money than it would in something else passively. And so right. that's kind of how you want to think about it this year. I'm going to, I'm going to say something that's going to kind of push a lot of people and, and 
I'm evolving into thinking, how can I have my money make money for me in terms of if I'm making an example, let's say someone is making 300,000 a year, 200,000 a year, let's just say 200. How much of that is actually made by you? And how much of it is actually made by other things working for you? And the way I want to look at it is that right now, 60% of my money is made by me. 40% is made by investments or employees or other people. I want that number to get to 20% within the end of two years. 20% of my money is made by me. 80% is made by investments, right? And then it's going to go to 10% made by me, 90% investments. Then it will be 0% made by me, 100% investments. So that's what you want to think about is that percentage. You don't want to think about a dollar sign number. You want to think about percentages. How much of your money is actually being made by you versus other entities? And the larger the ratio for, other, and this is, this is how wealthy people are wealthy. Other people's money, they always talk about that. But that literally is how this is working, right? 866-801-8255. So if you are out there Let's let's take businesses, right? Um, and I mentioned a lot of people start businesses from emo- places of emotion. You know, my father took over his father's grocery store, right? Um, he the first person to go to college in his in his in his family studied business administration, learned how to do accounting, came back from college. My grandfather passed away. My grandmother was trying to keep the store open, literally feeding the family out of the store. My father took over the store and turned it into a thriving business. But he was getting up at five o'clock in the morning, and then he would go to his job as a parole officer, come back after his job at five o'clock, close the store come home at midnight, reconcile the books, rinse and repeat. He did that every single day, didn't take a day off for 18 years. Now that instilled in me a level of work ethic, but I feel like he worked too hard. I feel like that's a lot of work. And and listen, I had a good life as a result of that man doing that every day for 18 years. My brother and I, we didn't want for anything, but I didn't want to do that. Oh, I can, I, I know how to work, but that's, that's something else. Right. So my, my question is, you know, 866-801-8255 as black people, I think it's ingrained in us to work, even though some people want to call us lazy. I mean, nobody working for 200 years uh, for free that are lazy, lazy people would never do that. So we, we, we marvel at our work ethic, but this wealth is not built on your work ethic. It's not the less talk about you- it the less you do, the more you make. And the thing is, it's not that the less you do, meaning that nothing is happening. It's just that something has to be done. It just cannot be you, right? And it's a very hard lesson, especially when we've got laziness and mental chatter in the, in the, in the, in the atmosphere. So for me, that's one of my worst fears is being called lazy, right? And so that's why I got to work doing something all the time. And even today we spoke on the phone and I was like, I'm just relaxing. <laughs> like, I'm not doing anything. I'm in my bed. And after we got off the phone, I, I ate food and I went back in the bed. And yes, the, the work ethic person in me was like, oh my gosh, like maybe I should do this. Maybe I should like check out the site. I should do this. I should do that. I should like check up the investments. So I have the most up-to-date information. And I was like, no, you said you were resting today. It's going to happen. Right. And it's not because I'm lazy. It's because I earned it. And so this is something that you want to check in with yourself. There's a bit of ego in there too, right? How we feel good saying we're hard workers. We feel good saying that we are busy. We feel good saying that I've got this meeting and that meeting. I'm working on this. I'm investing in that. But really and truly, what is the payoff? We're we're exhausted. We're not spending the money that we're working so hard to make. We're not spending time with loved ones. We're not pushing the earth in any better place. It's actually very selfish. Like all of it just to have that I work hard label. And this is the thing that I'm not cool with anymore. 